Hi there, everyone. My name is Max, and I'd like to thank you all, all, all on behalf of Romans Bookstore for tuning into tonight's event. Tonight, we're lucky to have with us Grant Farley, who will be in conversation with Michael Cart, discussing Grant's novel, Bones of a Saint, which just came out on Tuesday, so congratulations to him. Grant Farley was an English teacher for over 25 years, and all the while he was working on Bones of a Saint, and excerpts of the book have appeared in various literary magazines, as well as having been showcased at a number of writers' conferences. And one day, his awesome wife insisted that he retire, which is when his story really took off, and now he writes full-time and volunteers at a lighthouse. And with him, Michael Cart is a columnist and reviewer for Booklist Magazine and a nationally recognized expert in young adult literature. He is the author and editor of 22 books, including the coming of age novel, My Father's Scar. His articles and reviews have also appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, Parents Magazine, and elsewhere. Tonight's event does include a Q&A portion, so if you would like to ask Grant a question at any point, go ahead and click the Ask a Question button towards the bottom, and they will go ahead and get to that towards the end of the event. And lastly, if you would like to purchase Bones of a Saint, you can go ahead and click that green button down below, and it will take you to our website. But with that all out of the way, I will go ahead and hop off screen and let them take over. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Max. Hello, Grant. Hello. Nice to see you. Very glad, thankful to have you here to it's bring nice some It's nice to see you too, today. virtually. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to have a little lag here, right? You're very kind. Yeah. Uh, apparently we are, but we'll deal with it. Um, I'm just anxious to get to my questions, which means I may over uh, over talk your answers, but we'll try not to do that. Let's start, though, with my asking you, um, if you will, give us uh, a brief overview of uh, the novel to provide kind of context for my later questions. I'm always afraid of that question, so I wrote a couple things down, knowing there, whenever anybody asks what the novel's about, and you always say, I always say about 290 pages. So <laughs> here's what the pitch that sold it, um, or not, when a gang pounds, when a gang pounds 15 year old RJ into ripping off antiques from an old man, he must find a way to save his life without losing his soul. Um, my favorite blurb was the timeless, this timeless story examines the nature of evil, the art of storytelling, and the possibility of redemption. And the story is about a lost girl, the miraculous beauty of flight, the soul-crushing terror of a sealed room, the love and the burden of brothers and sisters, the horror of war that spills beyond a bloody battle and washes down through time, a suicide ride on a boy's flyer, a beach squirming with grunion, an arched bridge and scent in Big Sur, the Grateful Dead and window paint acid, the death of the stardust driving at the hands of the Saturday night fever, a boy's toes, an Airstein trailer, purgatory, an evil, evil tree, and the bones of a saint. Wow. <laughs> a generous overview. Let me ask you uh, now, Grant, to talk a little bit about the setting for the novel. It's very important. Uh, a consideration. I'm keenly keen interested to hear what you have to say. Um, so the setting, the valley is entirely fictional. It's sort of a real surreal place set in a real time 1978 Central Coast, California. Um, the places are all pigments, as um, RJ would say. Um, but it is edged with our reality, and there are places that RJ goes outside the valley that are very real, such as Big Sur, uh, Camp Roberts, and the Mission San Miguel Archangel, which is an actual mission and is the spiritual story, uh, spiritual center of the novel. And a couple of people, like I read on here, Dave, are bugging me to read a little bit. So I was going to sort of read the description of the setting of the mission, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. 
Um, so this is chapter 12, Confirmation. I'm sitting in the shadows in a corner of the chapel at Mission San Miguel Archangel, waiting for the right tourist prospect to wander in so I can make that cash. The mission sits outside Archangel Valley, but it's about as close as tourists get to wandering into our little world. I used to be a sort of unofficial tour guide here. I made more than a few bucks off tips, but that was when I was 11 and being cute was still a factor. Now the best I got to work with is obnoxious. The summer heat pounds outside, but it feels sweet soaking in this cool air and listening to my breath sliding across adobe walls. It smells like 200 years of prayers seeping out of the oak trees as I squirm down waiting for a prospect. No matter how many times I look, I always see something new on the walls, what they call frescoes. The high walls all crammed with designs painted in greens and blues and golds like someone went crazy with funky wallpapers. These big pictures on the side walls, it could be fans or seashells, depending on your mood. A wall pup pulpit painted in blues and greens and reds and yellows and even some gold and silver. The altar surrounded by for real pink pillars and all kinds of tiles and squiggly shapes. And above that altar, this all-seeing eye of God in its triangle, sitting in a truck in a cloud with these 3D sun rays bursting out of it. How do you figure something that trippy in a for real church? A product of divine madness, Father Speckler called it. How does a kid kneel and take God with that eye staring down there? The door creaks open and is crunched down in the pew. That's kind of, a, to me, the part of the setting of the novel. Perfect. Um, let's talk for a minute, not about the mission or goodness, but considerations of evil that are embodied by a very vividly realized gang of teenagers uh, called the Blackjacks. Will you tell me about them? Um. They are an evil that goes back generations in the valley. And it's an issue of evil is something that RJ explores and in questions throughout the novel. Um, it's, I guess, one of his obsessions is, is evil, is it a, an actual thing, a power, something that exists, or is it merely a concept? Um, can things be imbued with evil? The oak tree, um, the relic, um, can, um, what is evil? Can we have good without evil? Um, so these are concepts that run throughout the book. Um, I think early on in the book, RJ is watching TV and the, they're um, sentencing the son of Sam in New York and he has a comment to his brother where he says, evil is like a piece of gum. The longer you stretch it, the thinner it gets. Um, so evil is, is, is working. Evil is at work. Well, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by not only evil, but also by goodness um, and uh, the qualities that are represented in your book. Uh, I wonder if you talk a little bit more expansively about considerations of, well, I was going to say religion, but let's say spirituality instead and inform your book. Um, yeah, uh, RJ grew up, went to Catholic school. Um, he is, although he would deny it or run from it, he is a very spiritual person. Um, he is defiant of the Catholic Church, and yet he is very much a part of it as well. Um, what else can we say? It, 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 it is in every part of this book, the spirituality. Um, 
it's hard to, uh, to say too much about it without giving away events that that come up in the um, the book. Um, but at its core, it's a, it's a pretty spiritual book. It's Very ironic. Good. It's uh, ironic. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that, um, considering again considerations, I should say of of goodness. I'm intrigued by uh, a supporting character, uh, R.J.'s younger brother Charlie, who has a, uh, I presume, a deformed foot, um, and interestingly, significantly, I guess, the grandmother of R.J.'s best friend. Uh, says that uh, Charlie has the toes of a saint. But elsewhere in the book, he's described as looking like a plaster angel. And I'm wondering which he is, a saint or an angel? Um, well, he couldn't, in my view, he couldn't be a saint because a saint needs to have grown and been tested in, you know, our world. Uh, so he would be closer to an angel, maybe in the transcendental sense, where we're born into this world with good um, and imbued with evil as, as we go along. Um, so in that sense, he is angelic. Um, and as, as R.J. points out, he, he might look fragile, like the the dolls in Mrs. Elliot's store, um, but he's as tough a kid as they come. So you you can look at him as an angel at your own peril, kind of. <laughs> Very good. Um, I was really moved by the fact that um, RJ carries a Charlie on his back because of his diff Charlie's difficulty in walking. So I thought it was a very nice touch that i don't know where it came from it was just there you know it was there from uh -huh. the beginning of the story um but and, and he also says pretty soon uh charlie knows i am have i'm gonna drop his ass for good and so you know it, it's he's not being sentimental about it he's being he might be sentimental but not admitting it he's being practical and he's being what what a brother should be. You uh, mentioned beginnings a moment ago, which invites a question. Uh, how did the book begin? What was its inspiration? Well, two different things. Those are sort of two different questions. The book began, I know exactly when. Um, I was working on another book um, the big book, um, and in this kid entered my brain, full blown like Athena or something, and he started to tell me the story of selling his brother's toes, and it was word for word clear, and I wasn't going to get rid of that voice in my head till I wrote it down. So I grabbed a notebook and wrote the story down, and, and I put it aside and figured that was the end of it kept working on this other book, which is sit now sitting in a drawer somewhere, probably. Um, and uh, a while later, another story came in, and I wrote that one down. And I don't know, about six months later, I had five or six of these things. Um, and then I began to wonder, OK, who is he telling the stories to? It was apparent there was a specific person. And then I was wondering where and why. And then when, when those questions began to be answered and I could know who he was talking to and where and why, all of a sudden I didn't have a collection of short stories anymore, I had a novel. And then it was a matter of some of the stories getting incorporating, uh, incorporated into the present tense of the story, some of them staying as tales and some of them getting jettisoned along the way because they just didn't work out in, in the story, which is always a painful thing. Um, and that's how it evolved. Very good. 
you were, of course, a teacher for many years until you retired. And I'm wondering if um, your career as a professional teacher had any impact on the novel and its writing. It had a huge impact on my writing. Um, being a literature teacher back in the good old days when you didn't have to spend all your time teaching to standardized tests and uh, novels that were assigned to you, I could pick the novels, I could teach and work with the novels, and um, both in uh, junior high and in high school, I liked reading out loud a lot. I liked the, the students to hear the words. And watching and getting a sense of how your students react to certain passages, certain stories, you know, whether it's Huck Finn or Lord of the Flies or whatever, when the students are fidgeting, you know, drawing on their thing, um, getting a sense, a rhythm of what holds a student or a reader and what doesn't. And I think I began to feel the patterns and, and the ways that works. If there's a if there's a passage that can hold the kid's attention 10 minutes before the bell rings for lunch, you know <laughs> something's really going on there. So I, it affected my writing that way. And, and, and I would sometimes actually write a passage and, and, and even read it aloud, imagining I was reading it aloud in class and trying to picture how the class was reacting to that scene. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I have uh, always believed that um, the word and its power is a is a very essential way to uh, to turn kids on to books. Uh, kids who might be reluctant to read, I think, when they hear the words as you were just talking about, uh, that it can be a, a really wonderful influence on them to uh, develop an interest in reading. I, I noticed the other part of the question I didn't answer about inspiration. There was one other inspiration for the story. Um, and that was all the way back when I was 18 years old. And I was we were traveling in Europe and I came across the battlefield at Verdun. Um, and I was on the verge of going to college and my option then, of if I didn't go to college, was uh, to register for the draft and very probably get drafted into Vietnam. Um, so I was looking across this battlefield of Verdun. And it's just this, it was once this beautiful farmland. Now it's all these twisted hills and mangled things. And you realize this battlefield has been so scarred from the bombs that it looks like a nightmarish setting. And then they have the memorial where they have the white, the gray, the crosses that go on for as far as the eye can see. And the guide that we had said, well, under each of those crosses is probably the remains of four or five soldiers. Um, and then and you realize in a, in a matter of a year and a couple of square miles of land close to a million people were killed and we go into the bunkers and these little tiny and i'm i'm very claustrophobic these little tiny bunkers and you can see the cracks in the walls and stuff and trying to imagine someone living up in there with this barrage of shells and so forth and that led me when i was writing this book to thinking about the um carrier pigeons they used during world war one to send the messages and what it would have been like to be a soldier confined in that hellish bunker and releasing one of those birds to fly in the sky like that which connected to me with rj and his pigeons um his tumbler pigeons that he has in the present of the story so it was that it that experience on Verdun, which influenced me to 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 write the book, and and people often wonder how that that scene in Verdun 
in the novel what it has to do with the rest of the book and I guess that's my answer to that. Uh -huh. and a very good one too. Um, what was the biggest challenge to you in writing this book? The biggest challenge is the challenge that all writers have. It's the elephant in the room that when you go to a writer's conference and nobody talks about, but it is bottom line the biggest challenge. And that is how do you raise a family, have a job, do it, go through life, and still have the time and energy to write. That is the biggest challenge of being a writer because there is just so few writers that are actually making a living at it. And people say, oh, you know, I'm going to be a teacher. That'll be a good job for a writer, right? I'm done at three. I got my summers off. Piece of cake. I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll write in the spare time. Teaching is so hard. It takes so much energy, 30 kids of, of energy coming every period, and you're meeting that energy every day, five days a week, week after week. And, you're, and it uses what a lot of people don't realize how much creativity you use in teaching. And that's creativity that's sapping me from the writing. So the hardest part for me is not the actual writing. It's not sitting down at the desk to write. It's the time, the time to write, the energy, the creativity that's left over um, after you put the ki kids to bed. Or sometimes I had an idea for a while, I'd get up at four in the morning when I'm fresh, have my coffee, write for two hours, and then go to work. I, and that lasted about two and a half weeks. But, you know. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about publishing now, the, uh, the world of young adult literature. Um, your book um, has what I would think of as crossover appeal, which is a wide audience, not only of young adults, but of adult readers as well. However, the book was published as a young adult novel, which puts it into a kind of a, a literary box. Can you talk a little bit about that and its impact on you as a, as a writer? Well, I'm just, I'm grateful that it was published. So I'm very grateful to Soho Young know, Adults for, who knows, to to have to. It's easier to get published in a niche, in a genre, or whatever. So I'm I'm grateful that the young adult was there to latch onto it. But yeah, I, I the labels are crazy, and um, young adult is a genre. Young adult is like an umbrella. And you have every genre within young adult. You have a mystery here. You have rom-com. You have everything under this umbrella. Um, and to I, the idea that in this umbrella you don't have room for the for for um, fine writing is it, just bizarre. I mean, um, but I think crossover is fantastic and. I mean, there's always been there, like teachers always teach high school students like Fahrenheit 451. How did Fahrenheit 451 become a young adult novel or 1984 or whatever? Because teachers wanted to teach it. The 1984, I don't know if a, a young adult publisher would would publish that. Um, and um, I think Harry Potter too, the idea that those clearly are young adult books but the sheer scope and length of them crossed over. And I think books like What the Book Thief or Incredibly Loud, um, I think crossover is an amazing, amazing field to be mined. Um, and I was surprised a while ago looking online about with my book and it was classified because it takes place in 1978. It was classified as a historical novel. <laughs> how, how old does that make some of you out there feel? And how many people that, I mean, if you were around in the late 70s growing up, this is a book for you to read, right? Um, if you lived through the 70s or 80s or 60s, um, 
I, this is a book for you. You don't have to be a young adult. But yeah, I don't, I don't, the, the whole lit, it's too literary is, yeah, silly. Now you're referring to a review that uh, I saw, which did indeed say that, that um, your book was, if you will, too literary, um, which of course exasperated me no end. There's a, a whole dialectic in young adult literature uh, between popular fiction and literary fiction. And so many um, gatekeepers seem to feel that the kids will only read popular fiction um, and so they give it, um, give literary fiction the back of their hand, which is terrible disservice, not only to the kids, but to literature itself. Would you agree? Yes, it's, and it's, de yeah, it's demeaning to, to teenagers. It's demeaning. Um, and, and what about books that teachers want to teach in the classroom? Um, I, I, my gut level, I have no statistic for this. My gut level is that half the readers of young adult books out there are not teenagers, that they're 20s, somethings and older. Um, it's a great field to read in. Oh, the coming of age. Um, yeah, the whole, this whole too literary. I mean, if they were implying that it was being self-consciously literary, uh, pompous, um, Maybe you could go there, um, but to to discount something simply because it's literary is, I'm not going to finish the sentence. <laughs> no need to. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about you as, um, as a writer and a reader. I think that uh, you can't be one without the other. When people often ask me, uh, well, how, should, how do I become a writer? My answer is always, read, 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 and write, write, write. Um, but I'm curious to know if you were a reader when you were a kid. Well, oh, do you want the short answer or the long answer? Um, oh, give me the long answer. <laughs> okay. Um, story goes back to me, to my early, some of my earliest memories. Um, my grandmother came to live with uh, so I was probably about six years old, I'm guessing seven, and she was dying of cancer. And um, I would lie in, in bed with her and she would tell me stories. And the stories would be about her childhood in the Ukraine or things like Russian folk fairy tales, uh, about her journey to America, surviving on the plains of North Dakota, and then my aunts and uncles and them, and uh, moving to California during the Depression, getting work at Disney, the war, and all of this until a point where I was actually, you know, I'd ask her, what about me? And then I would be in the story. So that's, as early as I can remember, story was really important to me. And I can remember from that, um, when my sister and I were sharing a bedroom, our, our beds across there, my little sister telling her stories. And I think I was probably in part in trying to recreate what my grandmother had done. So storytelling for me was there at the beginning. And, and when we moved from um, Reseda, we moved out to the far end of the valley when I was about 11, maybe 12. And I was very shy and knew nobody and my parents would drop me off to little within hills library um maybe that library was my babysitter i don't know but i can remember this huge copy of treasure island with this big colorful illustrations and i could not it was a visceral reading experience i could not wait to get it home and then there was one of what was one of the other ones something by James Fenimore, Deerslayer. And, and then the, the all about books along the wall, all about volcanoes, going through all those. Um, so it was visceral. Um, I remember the only time I 
It was recognized in front of a class. I think the whole time I was silent in junior high was when the teacher read one of my stories aloud to the class. When I was in high school, I became editor on the paper, but mainly just so I could get out of class and go hang around places. Um, I became a an English major in college because I could go for four years on my parents' dime and, and spend my time reading novels. That's like my favorite time of my whole life. And they had hardly any of the, uh, how shall I say this, the MFA franchises back when I was in college. And the one, the few that I applied to, I didn't get in. So I started writing on my own and so forth and so on. So yeah, writing and stories are really important. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and they're important to RJ too, who is uh, himself a gifted storyteller. He tells stories to his younger, uh, his younger siblings. Mm -hmm. He does. Not unlike you. And everybody. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what kinds of books did you like to read when you were a kid? Was there any special kind that appealed to you particularly? Uh, anything in there. Oh, uh, pirate books, like I said, um, adventure books, um, any science book, anything about science, nature, um, all of that. Um, when I was in junior high, I got very sick one time and um, I was at home and I my dad had a really old battered black covered uh, collection of Sherlock Holmes and I read all the Sherlock Holmes in one week so now still I think when I get sick sometimes I'll pick up Sherlock Holmes and go read a few stories <laughs> Yeah, I have the habit of picking up the uh, Freddy the Pig books, um, <laughs> which were my favorites when I was a kid. Um, did you ever hear of the Freddy the Pig books, Grant? I have not. Uh, you've missed something. They're wonderful books, but talking animal uh, fantasies, which were among my favorite kinds of uh, books when I was a young kid. Freddy and the Oz books together, I suppose, uh, mm -hmm. captured by imagination mm -hmm. more than any others. <laughs> Was there a, a sort of a, a eureka moment when you actually said to yourself, I want to be a writer? No. Um, for a long time, I, I, it, was all, it was always there in me, but I don't think it was something that I ever really thought I was worthy of. It's like writers, you know, I, I'm, I like books, I like stories, um, but I, I'm not sure that I could pick a, a certain moment where I said I was a writer. It would have been after I got out of, probably after I got out of college. Mm -hmm. Although yeah, when I look, yeah, when I look back, I can see all these times when I was writing, when I was on the paper and junior high, I was writing, but I had, my dad who, uh, was an aspiring screenwriter at one point in his life and a great teacher and a great drama director. Um, when when I did actually tell him, I think I'm going to be a write, writer, I was like 22, whatever. And his question to me was, do you want to be a writer or do you want to write? They're not exactly the same thing. And that's what, and that really hit me. I wanted to write. Speaking of writing, I'm wondering if, um, did your characters ever surprise you while you were writing the book? RJ all the time, all the time. Because he was dictating a story to me. And um, he'd tell me a story and I, early on, and I, what the hell? What does that have to do with anything? And what is there'll be some random character in the story from when he was eight or whatever, whatever he's telling the story. And then six months or a year or two later, when I'm working on the story down the line, I went, Oh, that's where that's 
goes. Um, so I was constantly being surprised by RG, constantly. Yeah. Interesting. When you're writing, do you uh, revise uh, as you go or uh, do you wait until the book is finished? Unfortunately, I revise as, as I go because I get obsessive and revising is so much easier than facing the <laughs> blank page that um, it's sometimes it can be avoidance. Um, but also kind of, you have to go back and read, you have to kind of wash through to keep the story fresh too. But yeah, I, I, will, I will rewrite as I'm going along, probably too much rewriting. It hinders me from finishing projects sometimes. Yeah, speaking of projects, what are you working on now? Um, I am working on a novel it's a love triangle between three humans of different worlds. Uh, it's about Celtic lore. It's about an ancient lighthouse. It's about the end of our world and the rising of a brave new world. Um, yeah, that's about what it's about so far. Sounds ambitious. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking again of um, um, Bones of a Saint, um, what would you hope your readers are going to take away from this book? That room, I, I like that question, but it reminds me always when I hear a similar question to that, it takes me back to my AP teacher days and one of the popular AP essay questions would be, they would give the student a passage and say uh what something like what did you think the author intended for the reader to get from this and discuss the literary devices that led him to achieve it i would kind of i would love to reverse it and um i would i would rather ask the readers like everybody that's out there right now I'd love them to respond to me and tell me what what they took what they took from it, rather than me saying what I think they should take. I'd love to hear from everybody about that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. We have enough time, I think, for some questions. Uh, okay. So let, let's see if we have any. I wanted to add one more thing before we get to questions, if we have time. Please do. Um, sure. This, the whole idea of storytelling, which this, this novel is about storytelling, but storytelling as something, as redemption, as survival, as a core of who we are. And um, we are sitting here unable to be out at at Romans with each other because of a, the COVID and all that's happened in the last year. And um, we would have thought, I think we would have thought, maybe I would have thought at the beginning of this, that all that we had gone through in this year would have shown us that storytelling is really not important, that it's a sideshow to survival and all that's going on. And I think the very opposite has happened, that this year has shown us that story connects us, story is a part of survival. Um, whenever, whenever you enter, you know, so much, how often this year have we been on a phone conversation with somebody or Facebook or the end of a Zoom and we've been through some trauma or despair or whatever gets us through. And the last question we'll ask somebody is, what did you see on Netflix last night? What are you listening to on Audible? Um, so obviously my book was written much before we entered COVID 
but I think the theme there is storytelling is crucial to us as humans. And the harder things get, the more we need it, not less. Beautifully said. Um, I think I'm going to have to ask our friend Max to um, help us out here because I'm not having any luck getting into the Q and A part of the uh, the screen. Hello. Max, can you help me? Yes, I can. Hello, so again. it actually it hello. It doesn't look like we have any audience questions. What? Um, no. I know, I know. If you're in the audience, shoot some questions. Don't I know Grant would love to answer out them. there. Yeah, shame on these people. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you. I'll ask Grant another question. Um, okay. Grant, are there authors who have influenced you as a writer? Yeah, you go back through your life. You know, when when you get old like us, and like your life is like sections right and like when i was 20 herman hesse was it man i mean that was it and now so in different periods if any writer kind of spanned them i love steinbeck um and um carmel was a, an important place for me it's where my grandparents lived and i went up there a lot as a kid and um i think my most recent crush uh, has been Murakami. I've read everything by Murakami and uh, pushed for him to be nominated for a Nobel somewhere down the line. I think he's overdue. So I, I love I love his writing. How about you? He has a new novel out, you know. The last one I didn't, I'd have to say the last one I didn't care for, but the rest of them, fantastic. <laughs> Well, his new novel is called Clara and the Sun. It sounds fascinating. Clara is a, uh, a robot, uh, a helper robot who is uh, adopted by a family to be a friend for their daughter who is ill. Um, I haven't read it yet. I've only read about it, but it sounds fascinating. So you have to put that on top of your reading list, Grant. I just see over here that there are some, my wife just came in and said there are questions on um on the chat over here i'm looking um what part of the book is part of your teen years i didn't really base it on my teen years that much um i had those pigeons and my sister had cats so that was pretty much the end of that story um how did the books, how did I select the name? The original title was Toes of a Saint. Um, and that wasn't compelling enough, maybe. And it, I owe the title to Stephen Barr, my agent. He suggested, how about Bones instead of Toes? I'd ask people. Do you have any other questions? It's, those are the only ones I see up there. So, Grant, if you click the ask a question button towards the bottom, there are a couple of questions in there that you could answer. Okay. What's my favorite color? My wife just asked that question. <laughs> um. I said that, uh, what would RJ say about the pandemic? I think I kind of answered that, didn't I? About the storytelling and the survival. Um, John, that was a good question. I think I'm, RJ would have said it in a very sarcastic way, defiant way, but I think the idea of the story is what he would talk about. Talk about considerations of voice a little bit, Grant. Uh, we have time left. Um, obviously, you told your story in RJ's voice in the first person. Um, did, did you hear his voice from the very beginning? From the very beginning, absolute first words. And over the years, that first person present 
it has been rejected many, 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 many times. And it's come close a number of times to the SSP agents and so forth. And if there was any common theme, the two common themes were um, this book is literary, not young adult, from some people. And then from other people would say, this book is young adult and I only do literary. Um, so I was in the crossfire about both of those for rejections. Um, and then the other comment would be, well, you can't tell us, you can't write a whole novel in first person present tense. It, nobody will read it. That You just can't do that. It's not done. Do it in the first person. People reject it or just tell me it doesn't work in present first person present tense. Uh, you're talking to the wrong people, I guess. Because hmm. I think it works beautifully. Thank you. I do too. Very good. Maybe that will be our last word, Max. Do you uh, want to wind up for us? Michael, thank you to you, to Mr. Cart. I really appreciate all you've done for the novel. Yeah, Lord so we will, we will go ahead and wrap it up there. Uh, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a wonderful time. Grant, Michael, you two were incredible. And I can't thank you enough for doing this for us. And I hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Romans, too. Of course. And I hope they all buy a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, buy, buy his book. The green you button down below. We'll take you to ones, our website. Right? Yeah, we do. We do have autographed copies. So you can go ahead and buy those while we have them. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night.